Hello, and welcome to my talk, Addressing Wayland Robustness. My name's David Edmondson. I've been a KD developer for over 10 years, and I'm one of the maintainers of Plasma, our desktop environment, which means I'm trying to make sure our Wayland transition goes well, not just from the point of view of a compositor, but as the entire desktop. But I'm not here representing KDE. I'm a contractor for Valve, and they're trying to look at ways to make the user experience better for across all your desktops, make Linux in general better. So the most important question I need to answer is, what do I mean by robustness? It's a key word in the title. And by robustness, I mean the ability to handle an error. When we're writing code, we always add in checks. We always answer, ask a question, what if this fails? Even though something shouldn't fail, things inevitably will. And it's important to try and handle errors in a useful way. So the alternative title of this talk is, my compositor crashed. You won't believe what happened next. Obviously you will believe it because there's a video at the end. So what's the current state on Wayland? How robust are we? Well, if we take example of Western, you've got to open a crash happens, which we can simulate by typing kill-9 Western. And I have a bunch of open documents, I've got LibreOffice, or I've got uh, this thesis I've been working on, or some cop in the middle of moving some files in a volatile way. What happens if Western crashes? Well, all of those programs exit. And even if they don't exit, we're taken back to Login Manager and Systemd comes in and starts killing all of these processes. And from the user experience, anything that involves data loss is known in the industry as bad. So we want to avoid that. So can we do better? Well, it would be a fairly short talk if the answer was no. So yes, yes, we can. And I want to introduce a method I've been working on called compositor handoffs, which is a very fancy title for a very simple concept. It's a mechanism for clients to resend their current state to a new compositor. Because a client is a canonical source of what windows it has or what windows it thinks it should be showing or what content is in those windows. So it can just send them again. And arguably, this is even more robust than on X11. On X11, it can, your compositor could, could crash but if the X server went down, you would still lose all your data. So what we're here able to do now, because a compositor and a display server are now one thing, if we move this problem into a client, we get to address both those problems at once. And this wasn't possible on X11. We, on X11, there were too many blocking calls. There were too many server-side allocations, too much point-to-point -point communication. And all of that goes away in Wayland. So even though it seems like we've taken one step back, it's actually an opportunity to take two steps forward. So what are key benefits? What is the reason for doing this? So I briefly talked about the obvious one, crash handling. And I'll go into a bit more detail. I mean, realistically, all software crashes. I know I've set myself up for a cheap joke about Quinn, but Pragmatically, we can open the automatic bug reporting tools for any of the major distros and see crash reports upon crash reports for all of the different compositors. And that's just the very nature of software. In particular, I think we have a problem with compositors because they're taking on more and more responsibilities. So video streaming, you're responsible for proxying all of the input. There's more and more things in that single point of failure. And we do want that for security. It does have a lot of benefits. Things can be faster. But it comes with a, with a cost that we need to start protecting against. And the other problem is the Wayland world is still changing. I remember a day when the X11 server would crash relatively often, often enough that they literally had a shortcut to handle freezes. And that was on by default because it happened enough times to warrant it. And it got to a point that we stopped changing X11, and then that was able to stabilize, and I think that was a killer part. But your Wayland world is still changing. There are new protocols every day. By the time I finish this talk, there'll be another protocol up on Wayland protocols for us to implement. 
as we still try and find all of these niche edge cases that haven't been um, figured out yet. And the world's still changing because we now have the opportunity to start doing interesting tech at the composite level again. But it's not just about crashes. The developer experience. We always want to dog food our own code. We want to be running our own code constantly. And the problem is, I don't want to log out and log back in again every time I want to test some changes or every time I recompile a latest master. And what was happening on Wayland for a long time is I simply wouldn't. My, I mean, my personal compositor doesn't crash very often because if it did, I would have fixed it. So I can end up running a compositor that's two months old on my laptop where I've just been closing a lid and then I'm missing out on actually testing what's going to be released to our users. So we remove this barrier to testing. If I can just easily type Quinn Wayland replace as easily as I could back on an old X11 compositor, it makes that testing cycle a lot faster, a lot easier. But there are more benefits. An interesting idea that we get to explore in the future is the idea of switching compositors. So I can start a client talking to Waypipe being sent remotely and then at a flick of a switch, transfer it over to Quinn, or vice versa. If I start something on one machine and then go to another, and that would allow for the fastest way of doing remote transfers. We could get to do true multi-head. Currently, you can do a multi-head situation where you start a client on one compositor, and I know you could have a different compositor managing another physical screen, but you can't move clients between them. And there are use cases for that. It might be niche, it might be a very odd case, but we now we would be able to open up some interesting possibilities. Another thing that's opened up is Checkpoint Restore in user space, or CREW. And Checkpoint Restore in user space is a system where we can take an application that's running and save it to disk and then at a later point in time, potentially after a reboot, potentially two weeks later, restore it out of disk into your RAM and just continue the process running as it was. And if you read the documentation for Checkpoint Restore in user space, it's a big paragraph about why this can't work in X and why it can never work in X. And all of those reasons apply to what we currently have in Wayland. If, it, if you start sending IDs over a proxy a compositor isn't aware of because the compositor has been restarted, it will obviously just hit an error and get closed. So we need a way for a client after it's been restored to just resend all of its current state to a compositor and start with that clean, clean slate, which is what we've been working on. So what's needed for clients to be able to reconnect? Okay, the first step we needed to solve was a race-free way of doing compositor restarting. Because if a compositor goes down and a client comes down at the same time, a client could come up before a compositor, at which point it would try to connect to a socket that doesn't exist and bail out again. And we didn't want to just put it in a loop or something. So we needed to come up with something a bit better. And this is a warm change that's on your compositor. So we make a Wayland socket on disk persistent. And we do this by having two processes, a very tiny helper process that creates a Wayland socket and then passes a file descriptor to your compositor. Very much like system deactivation, and that would absolutely work as a solution. We just ended up rolling our own version for a few technical reasons. So if the compositor crashes, your socket remains. And if a client tries to come up early before your compositor has restarted, it will block when it's trying to read and write and connect to that socket. This is race free. It also helps us improve our startup speed. So it's something that I would recommend everybody do anyway. Like I was reading a code for Greet D the other day, and they have set up these complicated daisy chains of starting this process, which starts sway, which then starts to greeter. And it's so much, you get a much cleaner system if you can have a single process, set up the socket, and then just tell everyone to go at once. So everything's secure because that helper process is still the starting Quinn. Nobody else can come along and pretend to be a compositor. 
And a client, very importantly, can distinguish a compositor crashing and being able to reconnect from a compositor closing. Because if a compositor just closed, the help would close as well, and then there's nothing to connect to. And we really want to have that signal available to clients. What do we need to do on a client side? Obviously, the most important part of all of this. Well, in theory, it's quite easy. We need to handle uh, the screens disconnecting and reconnecting. From the point of view of a client, the W outputs have gone and we have some new W output objects. But screens can change dynamically at runtime anyway, so we need to have code in our toolkit for that already. We need to pretend every device on our WLC has gone and that we have a new WLC full of devices. And again, this is something that the toolkit needs to be prepared for anyway. The toolkit's bound to have some code to handle your state. We need to recreate our window contents, the buffers, but we need to recreate our windows buffer every time you do a resize or draw a new frame. So a toolkit's bound to have code for this already as well. And we need to reset the window shell, make that new XG top level and everything that goes along with it. And this part is technically new, but certainly within Qt, we actually had to have code for this anyway, because it was possible through our public API to switch between being a main window and a tooltip after you've shown this window, which isn't possible in Wayland. So we needed to have that code to tear that window down and recreate it. So. The point is, a lot of the time, we're just trying to hook into all of the existing points that already exist. There isn't a lot of new code. Everything that has to happen when we create, connect to a new compositor is just calling code that we have to do anyway at other points. It's just a case of mashing it all together. So I've got some example code. Um, somewhere in your toolkit, in your application, You'll be checking for an error. You'll be checking to see um, what our error code was and then exiting. All we need to do is when we notice that we've got a connection error, if we reconnect the display, we delete everything, we create a new registry, set that up, and then once we call the round trip, we'll reinitialize all of our globals. And then we need to reiterate through all of our windows and reshow your contents. Obviously, this is slightly simplified, but ultimately not too much. So now putting this into practice, I've been going around several of the main toolkits and clients trying to prove, is this something that's actually viable? Does this work in the real world without needing to change a bunch of applications? Can we just make some very small toolkit changes? Needed somewhere to start, so I want everyone to think about the most important Linux application, the one you almost certainly use on a daily basis. I know this is pre-recorded, but I also know everyone's thinking exactly the same thing. Super Tuxcart, very important client, but realistically it was also a simplified good demo. So this is an SDL. So one of the first things I did was I patched SDL. I didn't touch any code in SuperTypeScript, that's important to mention. I only patched SDL. And to have full reset support for recreating all your windows, recreating all your buffers, and mouse cursors and such, was only 173 lines. This is less code than it takes to support middle click paste. So it's definitely viable from that point of view. It codes harder than middle click paste, but it's a very small manageable amount. And obviously, being a KDE developer, I patched the Qt clients. So I patched Qt. This is quite a bit more work in SVL. It's a much more involved, uh, it's a bigger toolkit. We have threaded rendering to worry about. If you're using Qt Quick, one of our new graphical toolkits, you've got your main thread handling most of the connections, but all your rendering is happening elsewhere, and we're doing a WL surface commits from that thread using a using a queue being done by Mesa. We have drag and drop, data devices, all of these additional protocols. We have multiple shells to worry about. It's not just XG top level. We also have IVI and some custom shells, layer shell. And it's a much larger API in general. 
But when I made those changes, every application just works. And in KDE, we have literally hundreds of applications uh, written in Qt. And I didn't have to touch any of those applications and they just worked. I've yet to have a problem with anything that we classify in KDE as an application. There is one slight caveat on that. Um, there are some shell components like a, a clipboard manager, which is using some custom Wayland code. That's not going to work out your box. But anything that's just using a toolkit and using abstraction layers has just worked. And that goes from large text editors, from KDevelop, video editors, no other changes. And one of the other big players, which is a different case, is x -Wayland. And I packed x -Wayland. And I wanted to see if I can pack x -Wayland, pretty much anything else is doable. And the x -Wayland changes were relatively straightforward. There was a very nice, helpful function to just recreate everything for a given X11 window, and it would recreate all the surfaces and buffers and pointer locks and everything else that we needed. All your buffer code was, was fine. The challenge in this is because our lifespan of the x -Wayland and Composer is different, we do need, need to redo your startup sequence. We can't rely on the compositor creating a file descriptor for x -Wayland to connect to because we want that x -Wayland connection to outlive the compositor if it needs to. And we also need a compositor to outlive x -Wayland if x -Wayland goes down, which is something we also have code for. So it becomes a bit of a chicken and egg situation of trying to handle new ways of handling the initial synchronization. But we were able to come up with something that works. That's not um, deployed yet, but we we're able to make all of x -Wayland work. And one nice thing about x -Wayland is because the positions are being held by a client, if your comp um, compositor does go, does go down, all your windows are still in, a, in the same place. Firefox. Obviously, Firefox is massive. And if you're a compositor developer, you know Firefox does some interesting things, like having multiple data devices and things that we know are special cases. It's going to be a big thing to do. So I didn't patch Firefox. But the reason I mention it is because we did something slightly interesting, is you're able to, because Firefox has its own very, very, very good crash handling already, we can make use of that. It could be wrapped in a small script, probably better than this one, to handle your case. And it means when you, if a compositor does go down, we restore and we reconnect, Sure, you get a small prompt saying, this has happened, do you wish to restart all your windows? Maybe we could optimize that in some way, but it works. And the reason I mention this is because we, because of the strategy puts everything in the responsibility of the client, we don't need to have a one size fits all strategy. It might be best for your client to do something different. We want to get the toolkit support where possible in Q, SDL, GTK, x -Wayland, but maybe there are special cases. F moving on from this, the shell components where we have the panels and our clipboard managers. Maybe it doesn't make sense to try and make them survive restart. Maybe it's just easier to have them restart. And that's what we currently do in Plasma. We just restart the Plasma shell with the panels because it's not a lot of persistent data in the panels. We don't need to try and solve that slightly more complicated case. if doing a simpler option just works. So we have a bit of flexibility. So I'll give a demo of all of this working. Start a demo, I've got Super Tuscar open because obviously this works for any SDL client. I just took picking this one because it features Conky. And if we fake a compositor crashing, And we can see everything was stored exactly as it was. Still got input, still got my GL context, still got my amazing rain effects, still losing a race. But it doesn't just work for SDL. I mean, we can sort of my console survived. I can open system settings or Kate and leave some unchanged changes. You could make a point. And again, 
restart Quinn. I've got my unsaved changes, my important documents here, my settings, even though this is all QQuick powered with subsurfaces, just works as expected. But what about underhood? What changes did, did we need to make at a very lowest level that's going to be shared across all the different toolkits? Probably the biggest challenge in all of this porting work is OpenGL because every application needs to draw a 3D teapot somewhere. And we're finding lots of application users. It's a very critical part. It's also a standalone independent library. It's not quite at a toolkit level. So most applications will have a single EGL display object. And it's shared throughout your client code. It might be created in your toolkit, but you'll be passing it around as a native pointer for clients to do their low level drawing rule code. And most importantly, it takes a W display object in its constructor to be able to commit buffers and create the DMA buffers and, and the like. So we need a meta code to react to when we get this reset to clear up the WLDRM objects, the DMA uh, managers, and all of all of the globals. But at the same time, we want that same EDL display object to persist in the client space. This means we need some Wayland changes. So we know if the EGL display object has to persist and takes it in a constructor, the WL display object has to persist. So we added a new method, WL display reconnect, which does exactly what you would imagine, it reconnects. And WL display gets a new notification. Um, we've got a method with a reconnect listener where you pass in a callback, just like other Wayland callbacks. Whenever WL display reconnect gets called, the uh, notification gets fired. Mesa can now listen for your signal and react accordingly. And all of this work has been done. The toolkits don't need to do anything. This is one part that's now very easy to do in all the toolkits. OpenGL just works. And from a client point of view, it's very convenient. Your client's connection to your rendered device is completely untouched when we reset your compositor. So all GL context objects remain intact. Any textures you've uploaded, any vertex buffers, are all completely untouched, even if you're with now connecting to a new compositor. The only thing we need to reset are your WL surfaces and therefore any EGL windows and EGL surfaces. But the client should be going through and resetting us anyway. So the clients only need to worry about a small part, small part of resetting, and then they can use all of their drawing code exactly as before. Another change we added to Wayland was this concept of lazy reinitialization. When we call that WL display reconnect method, all proxies that we know about that haven't been cleaned up yet are marked as defunct. If you're in a defunct state, the destructor can still be called. You can still call your destructor on any of these proxies and it will do a relevant deletion. But critically, nothing on these proxies will ever be sent on over your wire. Because obviously your ID is one that the compositor doesn't know about and it will get out of sync. And this allows for a couple of useful parts. We can do thread safe reinitialization. Your main thread can reconnect, but a render thread can think it's still reconnecting and resending methods and it will just start no opping at the right time. But that saves having to draw all of your threads to a stop while we perform this reconnect. We also have a situation of unreachable proxies. Quite often, particularly in X-Rail and code, there would be some native display type at a toolkit level where we abstract a concept like a cursor and hidden inside the blob would be some proxies, which we were unable to access from within our WL display reconnect handling when we needed to handle a reconnection. So by having this flag set, we were able to deal with this at the right time when it's convenient. Whenever we then need to do something with that proxy, then we can do reinitialization as needed. It also allows for a lot easier porting. Because 
hypothetically, if I'm porting a new toolkit and I forget to reset WL data device, instead of it crashing straight away, what I will now see is a lot of errors appearing on the screen whenever we try and use this defunct proxy, but it won't immediately crash. It won't send garbage to your compositor. And that makes life a lot easier to see what's actually happening. So assuming you use Wayland directly in your application, what do you actually need to do? It's the exact same case as Mesa. We have that signal, you can listen to it, you can perform any relevant cleanup. And this is something that we have to do in KDE. We have some, some of our library code will do some Wayland additional extras, such as monitoring idle time, or we have a path to add in a completely unnecessary stupid blur effect to Windows. And all of that has to react for it to these changes. So it allows other bits of library code to react if needed. But what's the worst case scenario? What if I've got some code where we haven't made these changes, where we've got these defunct proxies and things aren't working? I mean, most of the time, without defunct handling, it will just no up. So you might just lose a feature, but nothing terrible will happen. But if it is critical, things will just crash. But the good part is that's no worse than what happens now. Right now, if a compositor goes down, the client crashes. So we have quite a low baseline to beat. Without bragging as my skills as a programmer, it's hard to get worse than everything breaking and dying. So it can o things can only get better. So what's the current state of all of this work that we've done? Well, it's amazing. I've been using the Qt resetting since around January, so it's been eight months. And it's been held off while we try and work on these other toolkits and try and prove this is a system that can work globally. But I've had it on my local machine for quite a long time. And as I said before, it really, really helps that developer experience. I can just type, I can type Quinn Wayland replace and I have a new compositor without losing my console where I'm currently working, where it's in the right directory and has everything I want. And what's the next steps that we need to do? Obviously, all of this needs upstreaming. I sent an email to Wayland Devel a couple of weeks ago. There was some feedback from Enlightenment where they're actually doing a very, very similar mechanism. We need to uh, add GTK support, which I'm trying to do now. We need to add Wine support. As they're all getting a Wayland stuff ready, it should be a very convenient time to do it. I've mentioned OpenGL, I didn't touch the Vulcan side. It should be a one-to-one -one mapping. And maybe we want to improve some of the shared abstractions. In every case, it was always cursors proved to be a difficult part of reporting with just because of the way the SHM port abstracts a little bit, but not enough to make this convenient. So maybe it's some opportunity to share a bit more code. The uh, Lib Wayland API is quite raw, so one to one with the protocol, but having a few helpers for registries and things might might make things easier for everybody. And how can you run this code today? Uh, there's quite a lot of projects that had to be touched. So this wiki page is a link of all of the projects I've mentioned so far. I'm sure everyone will have lots of questions. So I've added a lot of time available for them. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. And now we'll start the QA session. Thank you. Uh, Notafile asks, I'm kind of curious how GL works with Creo. There's actually a talk about that yesterday um, where some people are trying to make that happen and work. So that's really worth checking out for underhood stuff. The other option we have available is, especially for NVIDIA, we have this concept of a context loss event where you lose everything and have to reset all of your open GL state. So if anything, my Wayland work is quite very similar to that G open jail work of something has gone down, it's up to you as a client to reset everything. So it is a mechanism that we could hook into. 
Emergent asks, any plans to fix the race when stopping a compositor and restarting with a new one? So if you're using the same compositor, we have fixed this race. So Quinn for the last two releases has fixed with has been released with this race fixed. We've got our two helper process system where helper app persists. And I think what we want to do with making a change like this is to do it in small baby steps. So your first step will be making it so that you can have one compositor restart and you get that same compositor back because that also simplifies a lot of client expectations. And then moving on to this idea of being able to switch from one composite to another, that's a slightly more adventurous change that we're putting in the foundations for, but then might still have some more work to do on that later. So I haven't tried to solve that second problem, but we have everything solved for what we want to do initially. And one more question for me. Uh... Would it be possible to use this mechanism in combination with something like Crew to essentially emulate a mechanism similar to Apple's handoff? I mean, that's, it sounds like an interesting idea. Do you want to tell me what Apple's handoff is? Uh, basically, you can take an application with some state on one device and continue that application using that application on another device with more or less the same state. I think this, this doesn't solve it, but it unlocks a problem. Because I mean, right now it's not possible at all for a number of reasons, but one of which is a client would immediately try and talk to a compositor and start t telling it about IDs that a compositor doesn't know about and then immediately get killed. So we solved that one problem because from the point of view of a client, it just has a sudden amount of changes all coming at once. It gets told your buffers got swapped or it didn't get swapped. And it gets told the screens have suddenly changed and the input device all changed. But then we're just talking into code that already exists. So it's a lot of surprises for your client, but all things that should be able to deal with. Okay, looks like that's all the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you very much for your great talk and have a great rest okay. of the conference. Oh, thank you very much.